Hello. This is what Paul Gavis would like me to say about him. This is <laughs> He's an instructor at Columbia College in Vancouver. He has been so for about 20 years, and we will soon find out what he's been teaching all those students. And he has, um, he's been interested in, in libertarianism since losing an argument with some friends in school. So today he's on the board of directors of the Libertarian Party of Canada and the vice president of BC Libertarian Party. And this is, Paul, what I want to say about you. <laughs> he is the center of um, really libertarianism in BC. Um, when um, Larry Reed went with all, all those characteristics of um, moral people, well, he has a lot of them. He, um, he's very generous, he has lent us his home. We use his home once a month to meet. We use his bathroom, his kitchen, never any complaints. He has uh, good nature, he's, um, um, I've known him for many years, I've never, in, I've seen him in difficult situations, I've never seen him lose his temper. He's always calm, he can see the other side. Um, he's a wonderful resource of uh, libertarian literature. Ideas, issues, he will take opposite points of view and so on. He's a um, good person to have around. He has endless patience. Um, an abiding interest in liberty and hope. He's got that optimism. He has hope that one day a libertarian will be elected and that's why he's continuing to run for election. After that, I'm afraid to open my mouth. <laughs> I'll disappoint you. Um, I'm kind of out of my comfort zone. There's no blackboard behind me, uh, no math equations to give you. And I'm talking not about economics, I'm talking about uh, philosophy, which I'm an amateur at. I just like to read it, enjoy it. And economists uh, try to differentiate between what we call normative economics and positive economics, and we like to stay away from normative ideas. Uh, George Stigler, I think, best sums this up with his little book, The Preacher as Economist. Don't be preachers. And yet, our topic today is morality, capitalism and morality. Now, I'm fortunate to teach at a small college where all the divisions share offices, so I get lots of chances to talk with people in other things instead of economics. So, uh, the English department would look at our topic today and say, this is an oxymoron. Kind of like military and intelligence, and like capitalism and morality, or Vancouver Canucks and the Stanley Cup. <laughs> now, since uh, capitalism seems to be based upon self-interest, uh, they would claim that capitalism doesn't provide moral outcomes, um, unless we have some referee or policeman to ensure that greedy businessmen don't take everything that we have. Uh, some examples. Recently, an advertisement for a talk show called The View led off with one of the hosts claiming that she didn't think profit fit very well with quality health care. Uh, really? She doesn't think that her doctor can give her good service if her doctor refuses to operate for a fee? Uh, does she expect uh, some sort of pure interior thinking process from her doctor that somehow makes the services better? And does she expect similar sainthood from her hairdresser or her mechanic? Where does this idea come from that uh, self-interest and morality don't fit together? Another example, were you as repulsed as I was by the recent hearings whereby these slimy politicians raped the employees of Goldman Sachs over the coal for what? For being greedy? And so the people who took advantage of the regulations somehow were greedier than the people who wrote the regulations and expected something different to happen. And of course, never, ever, ever would we expect politicians to do anything for self-interest. Uh, much of our world seems to believe that there is a dichotomy between, on the one hand, uh, self-interest that produces bad outcomes, bad outcomes being what, uh, conflict, poverty, crime, and altruism, which produces good outcomes, cooperation, prosperity, social happiness. This is a false dichotomy. 
Uh, this way of thinking that social problems can easily be solved, that we've just changed human beings, we've made them less selfish, less greedy. Somehow um, we can uh, have the proper regulations and the social control and everybody will be happy. Well, there are two other possibilities here. Uh, first one, uh, of course, bad outcomes can come from altruism. Uh, the road to hell is paved with good intentions. Uh, this is the unintended consequences that economists always like to talk about. But I'm more interested in that other little box over there, which is, can't good outcomes come from self-interested behavior? And that's what I'm most interested in. The most famous passage from Adam Smith reads, it's not from the benevolence of the butcher and the brewer and the baker that we expect our dinner but their regard for their own interest. And that's the central idea that lies behind capitalism. How exactly does caring about yourself lead to good outcomes that benefit all of us? In our early life, we're often faced with what I call the fixed pie situation. Your parents set out a plate of cookies for you, and any cookie you take off the plate means fewer cookies for your brothers and sisters. Uh, this illustrates that simple moral dilemma between your clear self-interest, the cookie, and your supposed concern about others. Our moral authorities, our parents, our teachers, our preachers, put social pressure on us not to take all the cookies, but to sacrifice, sacrifice for others. And I think it's this false dichotomy that comes from this fixed pie thinking. The economy, however, is not a fixed pie. There are ideas inside of you that I don't know. There are ideas inside of you that can benefit me. And I want you to go through the trouble of coming up with those ideas that might help me. And sometimes I can appeal to your better sense. Uh, but most of us, for most of us, there's some limit upon how much we're willing to sacrifice just for the sake of helping others. As the philosopher Samuel Fleischacher, I hope I said his name correctly, emphasizes, few people realize that Adam Smith's famous quote about the butcher and the baker is preceded by it is in vain for man to expect help from his brethren, from their benevolence alone. Yeah, think about that. Your doctor, yes, he might be a good person, he might want to help you, but why does he want to answer the phone at 3 o'clock in the morning unless you make it worth his while? How does that person down the street who's going to stay up late to cook that extra meal for you, going to do it out of the goodness of his heart or some benefit that he can make for himself too? People often require encouragement, sometimes monetary, and the idea of capitalism is that individuals can find reasons to trade and that this trade can be mutually beneficial. Both sides can gain. Instead of a fixed plate of cookies in which my gain is your loss, your ability to see potential profit offers that proverbial win-win situation. Your self-interest can benefit me too. When I first started to realize that I liked capitalism, I was attracted by the economics of it. Capitalism seemed to work. Uh, just this week, Angus Madison passed away, one of the giants of our economic field. And his great contribution to economics was tracing back or trying to measure how GDP has changed from 0 AD to the present. And it's exponential. I think this is why economists are a lot more uh, optimistic than most other fields of study. We look at this long-term change, people are becoming more productive and we are making gains. Uh, the Fraser Institute tries to measure annually how much economic freedom there is around the world and those countries with the greatest economic freedom seem to have the greatest prosperity. Capitalism works. It produces prosperity, it reduces poverty. The book that switched me in my mind, that made me start thinking about the world this way, was Milton Friedman's little book. It's been mentioned earlier today. A capitalism and Freedom. It was a bunch of friends at Carleton University that challenged me to read this with them, and as I said, I lost the argument, and here I am. The first few chapters in this book were kind of simple. It's what I expected. International free trade was, yeah, I could understand why that would work. But then Friedman went crazy. He started applying the same market ideas to things like education. You mean teaching? Teaching for money? As I started each chapter in this book, I remember thinking, this guy is going a little bit too far. But as I read around, his, as I read along, his logic kept carrying me on and won me over. By the end of each chapter, I was urging him on. He wasn't going far enough. He should be more radical. He was pulling his punches, and he wasn't, being, uh, he wasn't carrying forward his ideas to their logical conclusion. 
this is a fantastic book for leading you on and making you think clearly. Anyway, thanks to this book, I was into the library looking for all kinds of other things that I could, uh, that would help me. That's where I found Mises and Hayek and Rand and all the other rest of the people. And at first, I was kind of disappointed by these books. Hayek's idea that there was some sort of a cultural evolution left too many holes for me. How can you tell when a social change is a genuine evolutionary progression and when it's just a detour off the main road? And as for Rand, well, I just couldn't accept her view that altruism is the root of all evil. Sure, sometimes it can produce bad results, but, well, can't altruism sometimes produce good acts, like Mother Teresa? A book that did appeal to me was Henry Hazlitt's The Foundation of Morality, in which he tries to defend something called uh, rule utilitarianism, as opposed to act utilitarianism. Rule utilitarianism finds the rules that might maximize social happiness, rather than looking at any particular act that might do that. But mostly I just put my philosophical reflections aside and carried on in economics. I'm not quite satisfied with what I found. In 1988, Bill Bradford in his Liberty magazine, we have some samples at the back here, uh, published his little essay, Two Types of Libertarian. Uh, the first type was what he called right-based. There are natural rights. We should read our philosophy, find out what they are, develop, uh, well, develop ethical ways of thinking and acting. And the other type he called consequentialism. Ah, finally, I found a name for myself. Um, the rights-based approach would be come from, well, Rothbard and Rand. Uh, the consequentialists would be people like Henry Hazlitt or Ludwig von Mises. Consequentialism seeks to judge government policies by what they do. For example, should BC raise the minimum wage? A rights-based libertarianism would claim that it is wrong to prevent buyers and sellers from trading with each other, from making voluntary agreements. A consequentialist would argue, no, higher minimum wages would make it harder for less skilled people to find someone to trade with. Um, I've had many conversations over the years with Walter Block. He'll be here this afternoon to help you with your conversations. And Block challenged me here. Um, he asked me to find some example of where a consequentialist and a natural rights libertarian might disagree on some issue. And boy, we had lots of fun with that one. Um, I think we've got it down to intellectual property rights now. Almost everything else we can see that probably there's no difference. So it's more like a way of justifying uh, or coming up with some ways that you think might work rather than a, a complete argument for libertarianism. Now, shortly thereafter, Jan Narvison published a book called The Libertarian Idea, which I urge on all of you. This book is underappreciated in libertarian circles, perhaps because Although it traced out the main argument of libertarianism, it was written at a time that Narvison was not yet a complete libertarian. For example, he still somehow or other defended government health care. At the time, Jan Narvison was known as Canada's preeminent utilitarian philosopher. Uh, this book details his argument with a guy named David Gauthier. Uh, Gauthier believes that our social norms, our views about morality, uh, comes from strategic thinking about what is in our own long-term interest. And Narvison's breakthrough was that he applied Gautier's contraction ideas to political philosophy too. And that's how he became a libertarian. So let's see if we can wrap this up. Is capitalism moral? Yes, capitalism what results from following a few simple rational rules by which uh, a person with self-interest thinks that if other peoples follow these rules too, uh, we know that we'll be able to obtain good social outcomes. And what are these rules? Well, don't use force against innocent others. Two, don't steal other people's property. If we're willing to place a voluntary limit upon our own actions, and why do we do this? By studying and thinking and contemplating about what it would take to live together with other people in a way that will encourage prosperity, not only for them, but for us too. Uh, this is how we can gain most from the social interactions that society has around us. And that sounds moral to me. Thank you. Am I supposed to pause for questions, or is that? Yeah. Uh, Who's next?
that questions for you? Silence. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. We agree with everything.